Palingenesis by Simon Hereward. Book One Progeny of Hate. Chapter 20 The Shadows of Lakeside. It was difficult to imagine the ruin of a man before him as an erstwhile king. Melvor felt little pity, for he was not given to such emotions. Besides, this man had gambled with fate and lost. His catastrophic end was on his own head. Borgrest slumped in his seat, his wrists and ankles manacled and chained together. He stared emptily in front of him, his long hair disheveled, his mouth slightly open. In all respects, he did not look quite sane any more. And it had to have been insanity that had prompted his defiance of the Ligerian and Nurian forces. What had he hoped to gain? Was this not the only way it could have ended? Here he was, the condemned man in his own walls. The crumpled figure stirred suddenly, and the vacant expression fled from his eyes. Lucane and the new governor from Ligerium had entered the Justice Hall. Melvor shook his head inwardly at the sight of them. The prince vied with Julos in foppish dress, boasting a dark velvet jacket or ganache, with hanging, dagging-edged sleeves and a pronounced metal girdle fitting tightly round his waist. The shoulders were padded out of proportion, and the sleeves reached almost to his knees. Julos wore something akin to a robe of state, of purple hue, and decorated beyond belief. The clenched hand of the new province of Lysan was embroidered in gold over his heart, while the heavy chain of the Ligerian governor sprawled over all. The brigand king paid scant attention to the Ligerian. His eyes were fixed on Lucane. Uncertainty and anger commingled in his demeanor. He leaned forward with a clinking of chains. Malvor watched him intently. Borgrest had evidently had dealings with the prince before. For his part, Lucane did not so much as glance at the captive. It was clear soon enough that the proceedings were a mere formality. They had dragged the former king there only to hand down a sentence upon him, and would not hear his pleas or explanations. Borgrest waited with growing impatience through the long list of accusations and gripped the arms of his chair in anticipation when Julos at last paused in his speech. The Ligerian stooped to select a narrow length of folded cloth from the three on the table in front of him. Slowly, nervously, he unfurled it and placed it around his neck. It was black in color. Borgrest was on his feet in an instant. I demand to be heard. I have a right to speak. Hands gripped him roughly as the armored guards tried to force him back down. He was a powerful man and desperate. For a moment he shrugged them off. I have somewhat to say. Three more guards closed in on him and held him fast. Julos looked at Lucane, his fingers still on the judge's scarf. The Nurian shook his head and looked away. Julos cleared his throat. By the authority of the King of Ligerium, the Duke of Estium, and Lysan. At this, the captive bellowed like a bull and twisted in the hands of the guards. Prince Lucane, we had an agreement. The last word was spoken in bitter accusation. Lucane looked at him for the first time. He spoke haughtily, as if the sounds from this creature were nothing but the moaning of an animal. The prisoner will keep silent while the sentence is handed down for his crimes. He nodded to Julos. Please continue. The governor raised his voice again. And the consent of the king of Nuria, whose allied forces suffered at the hands. No, you will not get away with it, liar. Borgrist spat out the words. His eyes darted madly from Julos to the Nurian and back. They have betrayed you. The Nurians are in league with the Dark One. Why do you think we spared them in the trash? Silence! Lucane was on his feet as well. 
The prince's voice had risen in pitch. Enough of your lies! If you cannot hold your tongue, we shall have you gagged. Judas stared at him in bewilderment. Then he faced the prisoner again. His mouth opened as if to speak. The Nurian prince was not about to give him the chance. This simple affair now threatened to become a fiasco. He frowned in frustration at the incompetence of all Nigerians and waved the governor to silence. Leaning forward, he placed both his fists on the table. You are a dead man, Borgrest. You died when you ventured to deal with those who have power. You, who stupidly fell in with a giant, now want to bewail your lot. He stood back and folded his arms. On the morrow, you will be put to death for your crimes against the Ligerian and Nurian people. Your remains will be scattered for the beasts of the forest. Thus ends your pathetic tale. He nodded to the guards. Take him away. The struggling man had gone rigid at these last words, and a deathly pallor had spread over his face. He allowed himself to be led away like a lamb, but when he passed in front of the judges, he held back unexpectedly, thrusting his face as close as he could to the Nurian. He hissed out a few words before the guards recovered and dragged him off. There'll be no throne for you either, treasure, not even a marking on the wall. Melvor was close enough to make them out and close enough also to see the quick flash of uncertainty pass over the face of the prince. His own visage registered no surprise, no suspicion. He had learned to participate adeptly in the courtly masquerade. His thoughts were his own, his observations for himself, and his quick mind had discovered more missing pieces of the mysterious mosaic this day. The glare of a newborn sun thrust long, thirsty fingers over the morning damp on the dewed cobbles. Shadows of the spent night had already congealed in corners, or behind walls, where they would attempt to wait out the irresistible onslaught of light. Flowers and tall grasses trembled under crystal droplets, as if in anticipation, for it would certainly be a bright, hot day. The iron-bound wheels of the death cart trudged their clamorous way into the main market square, where a wooden platform had hastily been erected the day before. Wherever it passed among the people, a restless murmur flowed in its wake, and necks craned for a glimpse. The clomping cart noisily rode above it all, for the people spoke in fearful undertones behind scarves and hands. Not a single insult or catcall was flung at the condemned. No child ran up to touch the cart for luck. No spoilt produce thumped into the wooden sides or the manacled body. This had been their king for many cycles, and some of the dread of his rule still shrouded them. All the noise from the crowd ceased as the prisoner mounted the scaffold. Rune marveled at this, for more than half the population had to have crammed themselves into the square. He lifted back his hood to see a little better. The Nurian on the platform he recognized with a shock. An older, harder form of the Malvor he remembered stood bareheaded among the helmeted or hooded guards. Here was the man who had sworn to kill him, sworn to avenge the death of his friend, if it was the last thing he did. Rune could still see the intense hate the mad rage contorting the much younger Melvor's face after the Council of Truth's decision to banish rather than execute the young prince. He had realized then how easily men believed what they wanted to, and how little they were interested in pursuing the truth. Fengor's lie had blackened Rune forever as the slayer of his brother, had robbed him of a place in Nuria, and turned the hearts of thousands against him. The bitterness rose up in him against the injustice, against the willing dupes of his brother's truth council, against the passive face of a man on the scaffold who hated in ignorance. 
Gorgrist mounted the steps and took his place hands bound behind him, feet spread apart before the block. The crowd grew restive as Malvor's voice read out the long list of accusations, as well as the sentence. The Nurian captain stepped back and folded away the scroll. A complete hush fell over the people. The former king's face was set in determination. There was no begging or pleading as the big man knelt over the stump. A ragged, uncertain cheer went up when the axe fell but it rose and swelled as the head was lifted up by the executioner and shoved on the end of a tall wooden pike. Several men shook their fists at the head, some gestured obscenely, all the assembly shouted and screamed in an ecstasy of release. The tyrant who had trampled them down and done them so much mischief was no more. Yet there was a note of hysteria in the clamor, a hint of panic played along the edges of their passion. The shadow that had driven this man to his end had not abated, and now they had declared themselves its enemy. The foreigners from the north had become their only shield. Asar had made all the preparations by the time Rune threaded his way through the crowds to the merchant's courtyard. The carts were loaded and ready to depart. The Nurian nodded in approval as his eyes traveled over the sturdy stock and well-prepared cargo. This was surely a man of experience and expertise. No wonder his merchant enterprise was so successful. He was hustled through to Asar's private quarters by the same bow-legged man. This time the merchant extended his arms as if to embrace an old friend when he saw Rune. Instead, he held both his visitors' arms for an instant, smiling as though he had just made the best deal of the season and had the Nurian to thank for it. Good it is to see you, Maresh, and doubly so on this day of celebration. Rune looked at him askance. What celebration? And why do you call me by that odd title? Asar inclined his head. I beg your forgiveness if I have offended you, Lord Rune. It is only a term of respect we use for our betters in the desert region of the Fez. He smiled. And celebration it is, since Myrl is rid of a vile suppressor this day. He raised his hands and did the little dance of glee. You hated him that much? Aha, my, uh, Lord Rune, you have little or no idea of the outrageous this man perpetrated against us merchants. He had no conception of the value we added to his pitiful kingdom. What would Breck be without its traders? Rune had half a mind to ask what Breck was now, with or without merchants, but he had had enough of pleasantries. I see the convoy is ready to depart. Asar sobered. That is true. You may set out within the hour, but first... He turned to one of the several litter desks. There are instructions for you. He reached underneath the desk and released the catch. A small hidden drawer creaked open. He retrieved the sealed scroll, but did not offer it to the Nurian at once. A frown creased his brow underneath his feathered cap. You are walking into your death, Lord Rune if you are discovered, and there is little telling how long it would take for you to die in Lakeside. Rune raised his eyebrows. You would discourage me from this mission? You think it is folly? No, it is of the utmost importance. In more ways than one, we have lost many good men in the marshlands. He lifted a hand to his chin. Imagine an enemy agent on Karth's Isle. It would not be a simple matter to stay concealed. And if you are found, he grimaced, but I go not to conceal myself or in the guise of another. I have traded in that realm before. That is our hope. And still, your mere association with Heron Inrath may serve to undo your mission. You will speak to Malik Yulian in person? I intend to. Take great care. He handed the folded parchment to Rune. The Nurian took it and looked it over doubtfully. The seal it bore was Karth's. What had he neglected to tell him that now seemed so urgent? 
and how had Assar acquired these instructions so quickly? He was suddenly filled with suspicion. How is it that you could receive a message from Lord Carth? I have only just arrived with all haste from the coast. The peacock feather bobbed up and down as the merchant chuckled. We have a listener, a Viron, like yourself. We keep her out of sight, naturally, for her and our protection. But she is one of the best I've seen, and I have seen a couple. Rune felt a little sick. Here was more evidence of sorcery. It was now certain that he had ended up amongst the dregs of his own race, the ones who were cast out of their own accord because of their insane thirst for the magics of old. Is that all that was left to him? Would he grow old in some hole, plotting and scheming about wars that had been fought eons before? He looked at the scroll with reluctance. A witch had caught the sorcerer's instructions and committed them to paper. Merely holding it polluted him. He sighed inwardly at his own folly in ever becoming involved in Karth's affairs. Certainly he had repaid his debt for the rescue by now. It would not be too soon to part company, he was sure. Captain Melvor shut the heavy door tightly behind him. The musty smell closed in on him, souring his mood even further. The semi-dark of a smallish room, sparsely furnished and stark, flared his feline pupils in response. The room had the air of a cell more than the lodgings of a traveler. The oaken cask, indeed. The entire place had not a single stick of oak in it, as far as he could discern but rather a proliferation of black pine that had not been seasoned properly before use. The odor of it was evidence enough. Yet the second-rate tavern, the late hour, the distance from the palace, the heavy disguise, all was worth it for the sight of the little man rising from a three-legged stool in front of him. Marish! There was the irritating bow. The sight of you gladdens the heart and reassures the mind. His smile was as wide as ever, but there was a notable difference this time. The low light played on a row of almost white incisors. Likewise, Asar. A bemused smile turned the corners of Melvor's mouth. You do not indulge any more. Ah, you have noticed. The smile did not abate. Melvor wanted to say that it would have been impossible not to, since the formerly stained teeth had been flashed at him so often, but thought it impolite. I am afraid that the pleasures of friend no longer agreed with my health. Indeed. I believed it aided one in remaining healthy. Alas, no. The merchant seemed genuinely disappointed. He rubbed his hands. Every user wants to believe that. But after many cycles of benefit to the nerves, one has to come to terms with a loss of taste uh, and appetite, the increase in bile, the broken sleep. He shrugged. Malvor wanted to add... The bad breath, the stained teeth, the inability to concentrate when not imbibing the extract. Yet it was certain that the other was all too familiar with those. Your strength of will is commendable. He held his smile in check. Asar bowed in reply. We live in inspiring times. He motioned to the stool opposite his. Please, do me the honor of sitting down, Maresh. There are matters of some importance to discuss. The Nurian captain did not hesitate. The meetings with this merchant had brought him invaluable information and insight he otherwise certainly would have been without. This night was no exception. An assassin from the Fez would make an attempt on the life of the new governor from Ligerium on the feast day of Imran, probably during the morning procession to the temple. He would be armed with a small desert crossbow, the tips of his bolts dipped in asp weed. The Ligerian guards would almost certainly not be present to defend their master, since a mutiny of some sort had already commenced in Ligerium itself, and would reach the outlying provinces within the ten-day. Merchants from out of town were buying up the sun-tied stocks of grain, and placing ridiculously high-priced orders for the harvest of the coming reapage. It seemed that someone dearly wanted the city, 
to develop a severe shortage. Food stocks needed to be rationed, and the trading in it controlled strictly. Brick had to hold on to its own supplies. Nalvor listened in astonishment at the accuracy and extent of the man's information. When he lifted a questioning eyebrow, Hassar explained offhandedly how he had acquired it. Strangers were noted easily in town, and assassins were the easiest to spot. No one in Lysan could procure Aspweed but himself. He had a man in each tavern or inn throughout the city to report on the comings and goings of the wealthy and the foreign visitor, with an eye to supplying some exotic need. He selected his informants with care. A northern caravan had reported on the unrest and grain shortages in Ligerium. The captain slowly shook his head. How is it that you may sniff out these enemy agents so readily? Now that they are under my nose, I cannot help but smell them. The Nurian leaned forward, smiling. You are worth your weight in gold, Asar. The little man pursed his lips. I am worth a little more than that, Marish, and I would like to keep it so. Malvor laughed heartily, then sobered. Tell me, why is it so important for you to keep the Ligerian governor alive? Ah, he is an excellent customer, that one, with an admirable appetite for expensive, I mean to say, quality wines from the north. He likes to dress well, too. Are you ever only on the side of the best bidder? The perpetual smile faded suddenly. I back the winning side, or in this case, the surviving side. For have no doubt, there is no room for you or me in the shadow of the tour. Malvor stared at him for a moment or two. You will not withhold anything from me, Hassar. The merchant held his gaze firmly. If you are strong, I am strong, Captain. He leaned back and folded his arms. Being a merchant and an artisan, I possess a quick perception and the ability to assess value at a glance. And you are a person of great value. If you want something from me, you will not gain it through flattery. Hassar broke into a cackling laugh. Nay, Maresh, I am but there to be of assistance to you. He folded his arms and inclined his head in mock humility. I know my place, I do. With the survivors, eh? The burr merchant drew his lips into a smiling knot. Well spoken, noble lord. Malvor made a quick decision, which in fact he had mulled over since his arrival. Now certain that he had somehow been isolated from the confidences of Fingor and Lucane, he had to establish his own allies. This little man would do very nicely as one of them. He chose his words with care. The governor uh, is a weak man, Nassar. He will not fortify this town or any other in Lysan. Imran knows he has little time or energy for fortifying anything but himself. He paused for a moment and then plunged on. I do not know the mind of the prince. It troubles me that he keeps his counsel to himself. I believe also that, uh, that he is deceiving the Ligerians to some sinister end. His conspiring with Malik Yulian may be to the disadvantage of Julos and his people. It may well be, he hesitated, shocked by what he had come to suspect, he may well be aware of the attempt to be made against the governor, may even approve of it. A slight knock on the door brought a low command from Asar's throat. A servant entered with two glasses of chilled rose water, a peculiarity from the fez. He offered the refreshments to the men and retired without a word. Malvor felt immense relief that he could at last share his thoughts. Too many schemes are running from Nuria to the marshlands. The atmosphere is ripe for betrayal and violence. A blind man could see the hand of a puppet master pulling all these strings, and I have little doubt now that the next blow will fall here. He emptied the glass with an uncivilized gulp and rose to his feet. The merchant rose with him. I tell you these things because I have confidence in you, Asar. Imran knows we, I, need every ally I can muster.
left a train of ox carts to make his own cumbersome way to Nunmerrick. It would take the caravan more than a ten day to cover the 130 miles, while he could arrive several days earlier and make arrangements for the permission to trade and the disposal of his goods. He camped at the forking of the southern road that first night. To the southeast, the trading route to Jewel in the Fez stretched for 300 miles, skirting the edges of the marshlands and the foothills of the Arash Mountains. It was a dry, desolate road, traveled only by the hardiest of merchants. His present route led straight into the marshes, passing first through Hurst, then joining the river Bagarat, and winding its way along the watercourse to a bridge opposite Lakeside. He had never traveled this road before, but had received assurances that the proximity of the river, and therefore fresh water, more than made up for the droves of stinging gnats and flies that frequented the swamplands. Hassar had even supplied him with a special oil that supposedly kept away the pests when applied to the wrists and neck. Arun made use of this almost as soon as the sun had set, for the calm of evening brought the first taste of the ravages of these bloodthirsty hordes. There would be little sleep if he could not protect himself from them. He sat under the stars, the not unpleasant aroma of the oil permeating the cooling night air, and stared into the flames. His mind drifted to the challenges which lay ahead, and the latest set of instructions Karth had sent him. It contained the dark suggestions and warnings he had come to expect. Once you are in Nunmeric, I will aid you all I can. Be vigilant. Be on your guard. We will attempt to draw you out in any way possible. It is best that you do not think of the Witch Isle at all, nor of the merchant contact in Breck. There was a paragraph that stood out to him, simply because no such request had been made before. If you can slip away from the inevitable tale, try to find a way beneath the surface of the town. This is a vast and well-protected realm. You need not look for specific information. Whatever you observe there will be your value. This, if you attempt it, will be the most dangerous part of your mission. Had Karth even sent this instruction? He had the word of a Burr merchant, who had it from a Nurian witch. The game of trust. And he would be the one who lost his life. He lay down ere long, fully clothed, for he was not too sure if Hassar's anointing would live up to its reputation. There were semi-permanent structures erected at the parting of the ways, and he had installed himself in one of these. Two other groups shared the place with him. The smaller, consisting of three men dressed like traders, had invited him to join them. He was not desirous of company, but had thought it more prudent to accept, for he did not like the look of some of the men in the other group, and there was a measure of safety in numbers. He had conversed with the men, who were indeed traders from Hurst, in the dialect of the Isles, which was the closest thing to a common language that existed along the shores of the inland sea. They had discreetly agreed on a schedule for guard duty, and he had been assigned the final shift before dawn. This arrangement guaranteed a sufficient period of unbroken sleep. He was, however, not to experience such a blessing that night. The dream was vivid and had the qualities of a nightmare. How buried memories may slip out from beneath the suppression of the will to claw at us in sleep. And here he marched again among the ruins of Belruth, Athera at his side urging him along. Fresh snow slowed their steps and powdered the blue velvety cloak she wore. She was older than he remembered her and pale as the stars at dawn. But her grip on his wrist was fierce, and her manner compelled him to follow. A shallow depression held several fallen columns of stone, their outlines softened by the rhyme song coat. He knew the place well, for they had met here on many occasions. All the cycle it was bare, even of grass or the songs of birds, while an air of mystery hung over all. She had loved this place. Now it was dark and dismal under the leaden gray sky. She whispered in his ear, They come at last to Edipo. He wanted to tell her that he would not trust her word, that it was too late, 
Yet he knew instinctively that she was beyond the reach of words, and the meaning of her speech had nothing to do with their past. Then he was afraid, and for no reason stood rooted and staring under intense expectation. Before his disbelieving eyes, the broken archway of stone was restored, instantly awash with a bright blue glow, while horned shadows slipped through in countless numbers. He wanted to draw the cloaked woman next to him, to a place of shelter, away from the demons with their strange loping gait. But the stream of apparitions passed him by on both sides, without a touch or glance. There was pressure on his arm, where Athera gripped it. He turned to her, but instead of the pale blue Nurian eyes of his former lover, he looked into the large blue-gray ones of the Princess of Ligerium. Helgrid's voice rang out clear above the rush of bodies. Swear to me that you will send me word. He was awake before the hand touched his shoulder. He passed the last hours of the night in deep contemplation, leaning against his pack. When at last he arose to stir the embers into flames, he had dismissed the dark visions as a jumbled version of recent events. Yet he had also determined to return to Heron Inrath via Breck, though he had made no promise to do so. As soon as he entered the marshes proper, Rune was forced to apply the repelling oil day and night. During the daylight hours, clouds of gnats would hover over the roadway, descending on the unprotected passerby with unbelievable ferocity. The road was raised in places to keep the damp, soft sand of the swamp from bogging down heavy transports. Now and then it dipped to the level of the surrounding plain, and a soggy patch of soil in the center suggested caution. What a cursed place it was! Here the smallest of creatures lived off the blood of others, and a wrong step might mean a cruel death. What would possess a man to set himself up as ruler of such an estate? Malik Yulian had to have taken leave of his senses long before. A little nagging thought slipped in among his murmurings. How long before? He shrugged to himself. Long enough, no doubt. What did it matter? If the man had lived a thousand cycles or ten, he had only tasted so much more of disappointment and betrayal. Perchance that explained why he had hidden himself here in the cursed lands. Seven days after he had departed from Breck, Rune watched the twisting of the Bagrat finally run under a well-constructed timber bridge. He half wondered where they had found enough stout trunks from which to fashion it. Measuring a good twenty yards from rail to rail, and stretching for almost two hundred to the other bank, it was the first sign of organized strength in this environment. Though every traveler no doubt welcomed the sight of this bridge, Rune saw something disconcerting in its sturdy beams and wide planks. Simple though it was, it had been built with a resolution this feeble realm seemed hardly able to sustain. He set his feet on the far side of the Bagrat with a little uncertainty. As he looked up, the faint outline of Lakeside lay like a stain on the marshy horizon. Julos hardly looked in her direction all night. Though seated next to her for the greater part of the feast, he was cocooned in the childish sulking which had ever been his last line of defense. The argument had not even been as intense as others before it, and his almost hasty retreat had convinced her of his present fragile state of mind. Too many weighty matters vied for his attention, and he found it impossible to cope with the majority of them. The dukedom of Lysan had become the hornet's nest he had feared it would. That is indeed how the argument had started. For two days now the Ligerian soldiers in Lysan had grown increasingly restive. They had obeyed their orders grudgingly, arrived late for meals or duty, and on occasion ignored their sergeants completely. 
This very day, Julos had had to ask the pompous Nurian prince and his men to take over the guard duty in the entire city, for not a man of his own force would take up arms. To him, that had been the supreme humiliation. Lucane had openly usurped the governor's authority on many occasions, notably during the trial of the former king, and had shown through attitude and action that he held him in utter contempt. Now the mutiny of the Ligerian soldiery seemed to bear him out, but Julos had laid the blame for his lack of authority squarely on the shoulders of Heldred's father, the king. That morning, he had received tidings from Ligerium of an extensive and far more severe uprising among the military of the entire realm. Furthermore, greedy merchants had shipped a large proportion of the grain reserve south towards the Fez and Turalum. Already prices were on the rise, though it was sun-tied still, and there was much talk of shortages. Gregoran had placed him in this impossible situation and now, through incompetence, had stripped away the last weapon in Julos' hand, the loyalty of his men. The Nurians laughed at him, an impotent potentate, and how he hated to be ridiculed, especially by the young prince, who was using the seeming inability of the governor the better to display his own prowess. Julos had gnashed his teeth when these accusations had spilled from his mouth, moving Haldred to a small degree of pity. But even this had waned as he had turned his irrational attack in the direction of her family once more. The issue of her father's slipping rule had become a sensitive one to her. Vengis had been right in that the war with Lysan would be a turning point of some kind. For her father, it had set off a series of disasters. He was personally to blame for the ineffective and disastrous initial thrust, the loss of life and prestige, the low morale. Here they were seated at the banquet table, the fourteenth day of hunting, to commemorate the overthrow of the summoner, but they were surrounded by a conquered and probably resentful people, a mutinous soldiery, and the palpable arrogance of their northern allies. She glanced at the haughty prince, three places down the table from her, and a cold shiver passed through her. For an instant she saw the hate that had contorted his features almost a ten day before in the palace garden. In the light of her lamp, he had seemed a ruthless and vicious creature, consumed by ambition, driven by passions she could not understand. Seated next to him was an older and more seasoned man of perhaps twice his cycles. He was clean-shaven, as most Nurians were, and wore his brown hair close-cropped. He looked about him with an air of guarded confidence, and when he joined in the laughter at some jest or pleasantry, his eyes remained serious and detached. She decided that he had to be the Nurian commander, who had led the reinforcements at such amazing speed to the aid of the prince. He inspired confidence, this captain, and was made of sterner stuff than his foppish countrymen. She would attempt to make his acquaintance at the first opportunity. As soon as the wine had done its work, and the guests for the most part had divided into little groups of gossip or jesting, Haldred put herself discreetly in the captain's bath. A knowing little smile played round the corners of his mouth as their eyes met. Lady Haldred, may I introduce myself? She inclined her head graciously, expecting no returning bow. I am Captain Melvor, presently in command of the Nurian forces here in Breck. You are our only protector then, Captain, for there is no one in command of the Ligerian forces, such as they are. Melvor's eyes widened. The Lord Julos has finally lost control over all Ligerians, even his bodyguard. She seated herself and nodded him into a seat close by. But you know that, Captain. There is no need for politeness, though it certainly is a redeeming quality in my eyes, and one the illustrious Prince sorely lacks. Malvor sat down almost gingerly. You believe in speaking your mind? I am too reckless with my opinions. Perhaps. I have no talent for courtly conversations, I'm afraid. Yet I think it best to put aside such games when times are so desperate. He raised his eyebrows. You expect trouble? Of course, and so do you. Why else are the Nurians still in Lysan? Why have you not returned to your land to receive a hero's welcome? Malvor smiled at the idea. You know little of Nuria to think such. I do. She leaned forward. 
Tell me about your country. The man's brow furrowed into a frown. What's to tell? The proud Nurian respects power, law, and order. Uh, we thrive on discipline, hard work, and stay watchful against the lure of darkness. The art? He looked at her sharply. Some things are better not discussed. You believe that the art will disappear over time? Perhaps. Perhaps not. We keep guard over the weakness in our race, steering clear of its darker manifestations. So we have to confront it. You confront it by ignoring it? Oh, we did not ignore it. For hundreds of cycles we have struggled against its temptations and manifestations. The old ways were buried with the shameful past. The Order of Questers was instituted to combat all forms of the art, and during the cleansing, many were exiled or put to death. Nurians today are not at all what the Viron were under Kale. In reality, we have freed ourselves from the taint. Why do you still fear the past, then? Why will you not even learn about it? We are vigilant. We will not allow disaster to overtake us again. We remove the temptation to aid the weak ones among us. Aldred lowered her voice. And what does your vigilance reveal about the marshlands to the south and the intentions of its ruler? Nalvor was caught a little off guard and could not keep the alarm out of his sudden glance. What is it that you know of this? The ruler in Lakeside. He was part of the cleansing? He was. Could it be in his interest to outlaw the art in Nuria? How? It would weaken his northern allies considerably. Nalvor disliked the probing questions. He wanted to speak forcefully, displaying his irritation with her lack of understanding. The art is darkness and sorcery. It is a tool in the hands of evil such as Kale. The words sounded stilted, even to himself, as though they lacked conviction and had merely been recited out of some childhood lesson. Suddenly, he was in the grip of doubt most fierce. What power did this woman have that could shake him so? But no, it was not her questions alone, but a series of observations and suggestions since he had come to the southern lands, which were now serving to unravel his beliefs. The new secrecy and arrogance of Lucain, the oddities of the Ligerian campaign, the scheming of the merchant, the claims of the broken king, and now a Ligerian princess seemed more aware than he was of what transpired in these lands. All these things had taken him by surprise had brought to him rumors and whispers, conflicting with the way he believed the world to be. Tell me your concerns. Haldred knew that she had arrived at her intended destination. Now there would be truth and transparency. My brother warned me before he departed for the war. He spoke of a carefully concealed master plan for the destruction of Nuria, which, as a matter of course, would include the destruction of Nigerian. His speech was fantastic and difficult to believe, he spoke also of the swarm of antiquity and this man's control over it. Her voice trembled slightly as she continued. He knew about the ambush in the Tristwood. He suspected he would not survive it. I have proof of this. She bit her lip. Malvor surprised himself with his next words. I have little doubt that all the events transpiring here in the south are linked and orchestrated. He moved a little closer to her and spoke almost under his breath. But there is more than one party involved and the Nurian king is certainly one of them. He hesitated for a moment. Yet I am unaware of a threat such as the swarm of old, or at least I doubt. He fell silent, thinking of the Burr merchant's face, hearing the eager voice. How would one stop an onslaught by the swarm without the art? Haldred spoke slowly, without emotion. Something had become clear to her. She whispered her next words. Could it be that your fathers were betrayed? that they robbed their children of their only defense against such a disaster. Malvor stared at her, frowning, but did not answer. Malik Yulian took in the cityscape at his leisure. It warmed him to see all its carefully accumulated strength and hidden potency. All the defenses were in place. Though the low brittle sandstone walls would hardly withstand a siege, and the dry moat would not even slow an assault, it was an impregnable fortress. What was a power that could be measured and analyzed before it was confronted? 
Build your towers and keeps, where no one could see them. Only reveal your strength after the enemy has committed all his resources. Beneath his gaze, the marshy ground parted, drawing back the curtains of wet soil and rotting roots, till the real Nunmeric lay revealed in glowing darkness and shadow. A thousand miles of tunnel and cavern, in some places twisting over three hundred feet beneath the surface, housed the invisible heart of Lakeside. Here the warriors of the tour trained indefatigably, the captive smiths from Fenvale labored without ceasing, the greatest of the fire breed fed and grew in dark light, and his queen warped and tutored minds of power. He felt the rush of laughter in him, for he knew his time had come. His power and talent had brought him to this place, where he could cast down the most powerful of enemies. He glanced beyond the stinking swamps, across the mountains of the coast, the reaches of the inland sea, to where the mist swirled thickly on the waters of the Witch Sea. Here at last he could see no further, for the mist was impenetrable, and no spies had ventured beyond it. Yes, Kale, you have been the mightiest of adversaries. But your ignorance was your undoing. Your learning comes too late. Finally, the man of action and strength had been reduced to the tactics of his enemy. Stealth and guile had brought low the proud and mighty. Now it ruled supreme, its web irresistible and enduring. Caught in helpless pockets, his powerful opponents had been isolated entirely. Kale hid on his little island. Veer sat in his cold mountain, Aaron's spears faced outwards at all other nations, and the wedge was about to be driven deep between Nuria and Ligerium. Myrol quivered under the sole of his boot, and it was about to find out that he had little capacity for mercy. Yet for the present, his kingdom was limited to the stinking marshland realm. The lord of the tour shifted his gaze back to the borders of his city. The Nurian approaching his door was something of an anomaly. He was as isolated as the rest, virtually powerless in the grand scheme of things, and yet there travelled with him a whisper, a small shadow of doubt. He would have been an obstacle to overcome, had not good fortune intervened and banished him from the north. Now he could be of no significance, for he commanded no loyalty or service from men, and served none but himself. Why had he come to Lakeside? He was a trader, that was true, and had interests in Munborg, but choosing a land route for his wares was a new development. It would be wise to keep a close watch on him while in Terallon. <laughs> Rune saw little at first that he would regard as sinister once he had entered the town. There was enough of poverty and the accompanying reek to make it no different from the cities in Lysan. The dry season had at least evaporated the black-green water from the moat, and most of the stagnant pools around it were also reduced to mosaics of cracked mud. No doubt the stench would redouble just after the rains returned. As it was, one would have to accustom oneself to the air. Larger structures marked the center of the town, most notably a sandstone hall, domed in the desert style. Few others matched it in size. It had to be Malik's hold, though it seemed hardly to match his reputation. The city itself had to be twice the size of Breck, but the streets and markets were not as crowded or as lively. Even the people were somehow meaner and dirtier than those of Lysan. There was no potency here, only a determined struggle against misery. If this was the extent of Malik's power, he would not even be a threat to the marsh flies. He decided to stroll through the markets before approaching the palace. It would be in character to study the competition and familiarize himself with the business dealings of this place. Many sideways glances followed him as he pressed through the people and stalls. 
It was not long before he realized that, as in Breck, most of the business was conducted behind curtains and closed doors, and not in the open market. At the nature of this business, one could only hazard a guess. Here and there, turbaned men sat casually chatting or simply staring, half asleep, their bodyguards unobtrusively close. They would pause in conversation, or lift a lazy eyebrow as he passed, while a quick glance of mutual recognition was exchanged. He knew who they were, for he had seen their like without count in the aisles. More brokers than traders, these men controlled the market, where nothing was bought or sold without their permission. There was another sharp odor he picked up ere long, emanating from the people in general. Not entirely unpleasant, he guessed that it had to be some equivalent to the oil given him by Hassar. Though clouds of gnats and marsh flies hovered everywhere, open jars containing a dark liquid and placed adjacent to merchandise seemed to keep them at bay. The guttural speech of the people flowed about him somewhat uncomfortably, for he disliked not being able to understand what was said. Ere long he realized that this was not the only source of his growing unease. The casual looks from strangers lingered a little too long, as if he was being measured or appraised, as in the arena. Here a scarred face would tilt in his direction and follow him with a faint grin. There a broken-toothed merchant would interrupt his haggling to inspect the newcomer with an eager eye. He slowed his walk to perceive individual threats. A rude laugh rose over the noise to his right. A wild-haired man slapped down his earthen cup and leaned back open-mouthed, his canines too long and sharp for a human. Three swarthy youths watched him intently as he passed. Their long curved blades gripped loosely where the hilts protruded from cloth girdles. A hooded woman, her nose hidden behind a series of copper rings, stared large-eyed and fearful. As he caught the stench of spilled blood and heard the butcher's cleavers at work, two men pressed past him with a carcass. It was carried on a board and covered with a dirty cloth. His stomach lurched sickeningly as his gaze fell on part of a limb protruding from where the covering had pulled back a fraction. He was certain he had glimpsed a human hand. Though he had known men in the aisles capable of such atrocities as cannibalism, and there were many stories about this gruesome practice among the southern barbarian tribes. He had never actually been confronted with the reality of it. Rune turned to circumvent the meat market, stepping round a wailing beggar whose eye sockets gaped as emptily as his toothless maw. To his left, a passageway opened into another square, and he escaped into it. He did not have to hear the clinking of chain, or see the sullen despair engraved on faces to know where he was. The slave market had an atmosphere all its own. A brutal force of handlers, the rock-hard cunning of owners and traders, the silent begging of people beyond hope, all swirled around the iron cages and platforms, around the booted or sandaled feet of buyers, then mingled with the dust that rose from the scuffling and bustle till it could be tasted on the tongue. A burly man in studded leather armor lost his patience with a merchant as Rune entered. The smaller man was grabbed and lifted off his feet. Despite the violence done to him, there was no relenting, and he wore an expression of resentment and determination. Behind him a cage was crammed with five or six slaves from the south, who stared wide-eyed and uncomprehending. The big man turned his head to look at the newcomer, then allowed his gaze to linger as the others had, and hardened to suspicion. He released the merchant and stalked off angrily. To Rune's surprise, the smaller man shouted after the retreating figure in track dialect. And don't bring your stinking shell back here either. Tell your master that we still have to make a living. Rune saw the rolling of his eyes as he turned away, muttering to himself. Buying all the slaves for a few coppers each. The market was surprisingly free of slaves. Most cages housed only a single person, and a good many stood empty. The merchandise on offer was of poor quality, scrawny or sickly, with an exception here and there. Prices should have been high if there were so few slaves to fill the demand. 
The big man was obviously intimidating traders to sell well below the present value. Groon wound his way to an exit, deciding that he had seen quite enough of the lakeside markets for that day. It was time to meet the ruler of this realm of sophisticated thuggery. Malik frowned to himself, supposing it was an assassin. This champion of the arena certainly would make an ideal one. Who would employ him? Not Veer, foolishly true to the oath that had left him the towers. Certainly not the Nurian rulers who had attempted to destroy this man, and who had no inkling of the true state of affairs. If anyone had set an assassin on him, it would be Kale. And yet Kale would realize the futility of such an attempt. Still, it was a possibility to explore. He motioned to a liveried servant. Instruct Tsar to prepare himself. He should stay out of sight and use a full team. Many lifetimes of dealing in deceit had sharpened his perception of such till he could tell almost instantly when a man was lying. There were always signs, slight movements of hands and fingers, excessive perspiration, quickening of the pulse, a shifting in deceit, and even better, the nervous tone of voice, the tiny uncertainties and insincerities. Even so, the weakest place was the eyes. A dueling man knew the intentions of his opponent by reading them there, and a measuring of trust was much the same thing. Gauging the character of a man was discovering the way in which he would lie. A groveling, fawning man lied all the time, for he thought nothing of himself. A proud man hardly ever lied, and when he did it was difficult, for lies were debasing and in conflict with his sense of self. The dangerous man was the ruthless one who had steeled himself into accepting that lies were weapons, a means to an end. It weakened one's enemies, leaving them in confusion, even made them act against their interest. He had little doubt that the man who had walked into his audience chamber was a proud man, and as such, a weak man. Here was hardly any talent for deceit. Despite this, there was a potent warning in his mind, the suggestion of a sharp threat lurking close. Rune ignored the nervous tightening of his stomach as he passed between the guards into the inner chamber. He no longer had the blade as a last resort if he was discovered, for he would receive no audience with the master of Lakeside while armed. When reluctantly handing over his weapon, he had decided that the game of information gathering was definitely not for him. He had nerve enough to face a score of enemies in an arena but the gambling and grave risk of the schemer left him feeling like a novice. He stepped into the semi-dark, his eyes taking but a moment to adjust. Six guards lined the walls on both sides, carrying tall pikes with curved blades at the extremities. Malik Yulian was seated on a dark marble throne, one of a twin pair squatting on top of a raised dais. As Rune approached, he was surprised at how little he recalled of this man's features from their previous encounter. Long, delicate fingers sprawled over the carvings of the armrests, three on the left hand adorned with golden rings. The dark, rather short hair reached backwards from a tall forehead. High cheekbones and an aquiline nose stood proudly under the pale skin, not yet stretched with age. He wore no beard. All the features faded in comparison with the deep-set eyes. They were deep red in color and seemed to hold what light there was in this dismal illumination. A single jewel, suspended from a silver chain and of a matching hue to the eyes, lay lightly on his chest. There was no other badge of office, and his attire in the manner of lords was modest enough. A green velvet coat, dark and pleated from the waist, reached almost to his knees. His hose was the color of pale desert sand and disappeared into tall leather boots, highly polished and elaborately embossed. Malik watched the proud gait of the approaching man with amusement. He knew there would be no bow or show of respect and subservience. The arrogance of this race hardly allowed them to incline their heads. 
What a pleasure it was to bring low such haughtiness. But for now he would measure his words and wear the mask of humanity. He rose to his feet. Lord Rune. The game was on. Rune felt his discomfort deepen at the odd way in which Malik's voice echoed in the chamber. Though there was no obvious show of power, he had not spent the many cycles measuring the quality and resolve of opponents to mistake the latent threat behind this ability. He purposed to match the other's feigned heartiness. Lord Malik, he stretched out his hand. How generous of you to grant me an audience so speedily. His hand was grasped warmly. In fact, my business demands such prompt action, as you are well aware. I have a sincere appreciation for the importance of timing. Malik's smile was half mocking. He could detect no tension or uneasiness in the other's bearing as yet. Could it be that this little Viran fly was unaware of the lethal web on which he was dancing? How superbly ironic! They seated themselves, and Rune launched himself into the prepared part of the negotiations. He listed the goods he wished to trade in Lakeside and beyond, speculated a little on the future, complained just enough about conditions and prices, and closed his argument with an offer of a third of profits for the merchant's license. This was slightly above the normal quarter, but he insisted that he was eager to prove his good faith. Throughout the monologue, he felt Malik's eyes on him. The man had a strange mannerism of twisting his beringed left hand outwardly from time to time. It was distracting and sparked thoughts of enchantment in Rune's mind. When he had concluded, the hand went to Malik's chin, where the thumb and forefinger slowly drew its outline. You are aware that the competition on the trade routes to Munbor can be real cutthroat. The shadow of a smile lay on his thin lips. I have traded there before, and I've cut a few throats in my own ear now. Both men grinned at this pleasantry. You will station yourself in Breck. You have a contact there. A warning sounded in Rune's mind. Had he mentioned Breck before? What did Malik know of Asar? He made an effort to banish the thought of the Burr Merchant but felt an odd compulsion to conjure his image before his mind's eye. Something pulled his mind towards Breck till he could think of nothing else. Malik was watching him closely. Certainly, there was some mischief in the air, and he felt a touch of fear. A shadow had fallen over the city in his mind, and for a moment he tasted the despair of the damned. It was a struggle to wake from it. At once he was reminded of the words of the master of Heron Inrath. They were quite a pair, these two. Breck, he shrugged. Lysan seems a little unstable at present. I would rather keep an agent there and remain in the Isles. Malik seemed hardly to have heard. There was the odd wrist movement again. It was with grief that I learned of your recent banishment from the Ligerian realm. Terrible thing, such strife among relations. The eyes watched his every move. You understand the pressure to which I am subjected as a Nurian ally. The last two words were spoken with strange undertones. Rune picked up a slight disdain and even revulsion in the man's manner. He remembered the warnings of Karth at once and considered the probability of Malik wanting him to notice his tone. He kept his voice disinterested. This need not stand in the way of business. I have representatives in the nations who find my presence uh, undesirable. My traders do well in Nuria and Ligerium, despite the ban, he smiled. Where there is a need, there is a market. And where there is a market, there is a merchant. Malik concluded for him. Yes, the adage runs true even in times of struggle and strife. He returned the smile. Lord Ruin. I am prepared to accept the terms you have proposed. Once we can draw up our agreement, you are free to look about the city for a locale and an agent. Rune felt the release of pressure on his mind. Sweat had trickled down his back, and he had to force himself not to breathe too heavily. Excellent. If the other noticed his struggle, he gave no sign. Let us refresh ourselves while they summon the scribe. 
As Rune followed the master of Lakeside to an ante-room, he could not help wondering about the nature of these refreshments, and whether Malik shared the perverse taste of some of his subjects. By sunset of his first day in Lakeside, Rune could sit back to his even meal with satisfaction. As far as he was concerned, everything had run smoothly, and there could be little suspicion about his intentions here. It was hardly surprising, since he knew how to conduct his affairs, and had even considered settling in Munborg not so long before. He had selected the large and public inn at which to spend the night, and had made sure that there was more than one entrance. While consuming the quite reasonable fare, he glanced about him for the man assigned to keep an eye on him. Two or three candidates immediately drew his attention, but the most likely one was a bearded fellow sitting in a corner behind him. He first noticed the man's casual stare when ordering his meal. The barmaid stood between them, partially obscuring his view. When she placed a hand on her hip, he noticed the all-too-interested stranger through the space between her arm and body. The table at which she was seated was empty of plates or bowls. A single mug stood in front of him. Bruin took care not to look in his direction again. Out of the corner of an eye, he scrutinized the man's movements, or lack thereof, from time to time. Men came to inns for two basic reasons, food and company. This man enjoyed neither. If he had come for a drink of ale, surely he would have met a friend or acquaintance here. If he was a traveler like Rune, why would he not have a meal? There were, of course, plenty of trollops about, but he seemed to pay them little attention. Rune was finally sure of his man towards the end of the second night watch. He had lingered at his table on purpose, even engaging the innkeeper in conversation about supplies and conditions in the city. The other suspects had disappeared by the time he was ready for bed, yet the beardling still remained. Now he made a show of his fatigued state, yawned expressively, and stomped off to his room. He did not have to pretend too much, for he was tired after the tensions of the day. Yet in a while the real work would begin. Once behind the closed door of his room, he changed his clothes for the ones of darkest hue. It was a sultry night, and he decided against wearing a cloak. The hooded short coat would do. Now he extinguished the lamp, and lay down for a while, though the night could be advanced enough to venture out. It troubled him that he did not know the city at all, but he had a strong notion where to start, the slave market. He had noticed the large trapdoors in the square, and suspected that the slaves were housed underground while waiting to be sold. When he was sure that the third watch was half spent, he rose up silently and stole over to the open window. This was not barred, since he had selected a room on the higher level. The window overlooked a small courtyard with a locked gate that would probably be watched with the main exits. He had no intention of making use of this, however. His route led over the roof. He made sure that no one lurked in the deep shadows of the yard before stepping onto the sill and reaching for the rough tiling of the roof. He had concealed the blade by fastening the sheath inside his coat and tied a handkerchief mask-like over his nose and mouth. Even though he moved slowly and with the utmost care, there was a tight moment or two when the brittle sun-baked tiles would not support his weight. In the end, he had to crawl on all fours like an animal before he reached the far side. There was no reason to watch this part of the inn, furthest from the entrances. He kept to the shadows nonetheless, and picked a spot free from stones in the garden to land on when he leaped from the roof. He could not risk leaving a rope, and had already decided not to enter the inn again by this route. The streets were deserted. Wherever the seedy citizens were enjoying themselves, it was not in the neighborhood of the markets. The place lacked even patrols or night watchmen, being so silent and forlorn that it brought a shiver up his spine. 
He covered the half a mile or so quickly, for he had little enough time to investigate. When he stepped among the empty cages of the market, Lauren's eyes were already directly overhead. Two of the several trap doors were open, with stairs disappearing into them. A dry, hacking cough echoed up from one of these. Silent as a cat, he crept down the dusty steps. A dim light flickered ahead round a corner. He pressed himself against the wall, ignoring the rancid smell of unwashed bodies and stale food that drifted past him into the night air outside. A short, fat handler came into view. He was seated on a crate and all but dozing off. The slaves were locked in and secure, so there was little reason to be vigilant. The cough sounded again, loud in the enclosed space. The handler jerked away and looked about him. He muttered something under his breath and shot a murderous glance in the direction of the noise. Yawning, he leaned back against the wall. A draught made the lamp flicker, sending his squashed shadow leaping over the floor. He had hardly settled when the coughing once more rang out forcefully from the dark. Roused to anger, he leaped from the crate and sauntered off in the direction of the noise. Rune grabbed his opportunity. In a moment he slipped the blade into his hand, but he did not compose it. Swiftly he closed up to the handler, who stood outside a large cage mouthing threats in muted tones at the dark interior. He struck the man hard, just behind the ear with the hilt of his blade. Before the body hit the ground, he had grabbed the rough jerkin with his free hand. Quickly he sheathed the weapon and reached down to tear a metal key ring from the handler's belt. Six heavy keys were suspended from it. The second one he tried opened the cell door. There was a scuffling inside in the dark, and several voices spoke up in puzzlement. Rune dragged the heavy body inside none too gently and let it slide to the floor. The coughing old man stared at him, a hand held over his mouth. Three women and a youth pressed towards the door, but he stepped out and shut them in. He twisted the key in the lock and spoke to them in a whisper. Keep him quiet till I return, and you can have these. He shook the ring till the large metal keys jangled together. Not waiting to see if they understood or agreed, he passed the flaring lamp and disappeared into the dark beyond. It did not take long to find what he had suspected to be down here. A central underground compound housing all the slaves brought to Lakeside for trade sprawled in a large cavern-like hall just below the market itself. The air here was dead and stifling, heavy with hopelessness and pain. Even this place seemed sparsely populated. The rows of cells along the outer walls were deserted. Rune kept in the shadows, silently working his way towards one of the exits. There had to be other chambers connected via the several passages opening into the place. Four long rows of cages stretched down the middle of the cavern towards the wall opposite. The huddled shapes he could make out did not stir as he flitted by. He passed the first exit, noticing the bars and sturdy gate fitted to prevent access. The section to the next opening lay in deep shadow. A large, single cage took up nearly a third of the wall space and he could make out the diminutive forms of sleeping children inside it. Three more passageways yawned from the side of the hall he was on, two of which were marked with wall lamps. A third opened right next to the children's cage. In the deep dark, he could make out the iron bars of another gate. This was the one he would try. There seemed to be no guards or handlers in the compound. Still, he used the utmost stealth to work his way to the doorway. It would not be wise to wake a slave who could unwittingly betray his presence. As he expected, none of the keys would open the gate. This was certainly a good sign, as was the fact that the lock was grimy and stiff with disuse. The slavers would not have access to the regions he needed to explore. He had almost decided to risk the noise of smashing the lock, when he noticed that the shape of the roof here would probably allow him to slip over the spiky ends of the gate rods. It was a tight fit, and he almost maneuvered himself into a painful trap. His coat had snagged on the twisted metal, and by some miracle he checked and freed it before jumping down. 
The dusk rose in the dark below beneath him as his feet touched the passage floor. The stale smell of it almost made him cough, while the barely discernible clouds spread about him in the murk. It was a clear signal that no one had been this way recently. He fervently hoped that the passage had not become unusable owing to a collapse of the roof somewhere, leaving him to risk so much only to explore a dead end. He had no light with him and would have to trust to his keen sight in the dark. Two hundred yards of careful walking brought him to a place where the passage angled away sharply towards his left. A faint glow reached from beyond it to set off the rough stones of the corner in stark silhouette. It was a connecting tunnel after all, and one merely closed for convenience. The floor of the passage fell away steeply as he followed its rounding into the glow of lamplight. Another gate barred his way at the junction where the passage ended. A wider tunnel stretched away to left and right. A lamp cast its brightness from a point just beyond his line of sight. He was about to scale this gate also when a faint sound like the rustle of clothing brought him up short. He pressed into the darkest corner, away from the noise, and held his breath. Immediately he noticed the shifting light and heard the shuffling of footsteps. The odd angles and echoes had deceived him, however, for he had hardly shrunk back when a grim figure, with lantern turned low, stepped into plain view from the opposite side he had expected. Rune froze. He knew instinctively not to move a muscle, that it was too late to leap for the far and sheltered side of the passage. As it was, the man had but to look in his direction and he would be discovered. All he could hope for was that the light in the passage contrasting with the darkness of his hiding place would aid his concealment sufficiently, or that the man approaching, long accustomed to the emptiness of the sealed passage, would not expect to see a figure huddling there. The man was not alone, but brought an eerie procession in his wake. While he was robed in black and hooded, the children following behind wore loose-fitting robes of white and went bareheaded so that he could make out their features clearly. They had the deathly pale skin of Malik, and many had the unfamiliar wine-colored eyes. Tour. The realization jumped to his mind as they passed him, all staring dumbly ahead. It seemed at once that they were on their way to some ritual, except that their hands were manacled and their expressions fearful. Perchance they were, but to the kind where their participation would not be voluntary or beneficial. He counted thirty-two of them, all certainly under the age of ten cycles. He had but seen three or four girls among them, though it was difficult to tell. The rear was brought up by two more black-clad figures. Their hoods were down, and he recognized the by now familiar coloring of the tour. These frowned into the relative brightness of the lamplight, and he understood that the glow would probably blind them to his presence. For the few moments it took for the line to pass, Rune sat in breathless silence. He had begun to see why Karth had requested this excursion into the subterranean passages of Nunmeric. A large proportion of what Lakeside was could evidently not be examined on the surface. Yet he had but a night or two to explore this mystery. What could he possibly discover during so short a time? He waited till there was no whisper of sound before squeezing through the more generous gap this gate offered him. An uncomfortable amount of light played in the passage, and he hurried down it in the direction from which the tour had come, towards darker regions. With no key and little skill at picking locks, he would have to trust to luck or negligence to further his mission. The passage twisted through two intersections, both suggesting two alternate routes to the one he was on. He decided to keep as straight and simple a course as he could, for fear of losing his way in the unfamiliar underground. Once the passage had widened to the point where it could easily accommodate two ox carts abreast, doors appeared in the sides. The tunnel, which had been sloping downwards continuously, now leveled off for a dozen or more yards every time he passed the doorway. He was tempted to try one or two, but thought it a little risky. Opening a door here without an idea what was beyond was like trying to measure the depth of a dark well by leaping into it. Soon the passage gave way to a circular hall, the size of the amphitheater in Aruis, 
and similar in construction. Statues of some crude design guarded the center. The roof here rose out of sight into the darkness, and the whole of the cavernous chamber lay beneath him in mysterious shadow, a temple. Once again the words leaped into his thoughts as if of their own accord. Stairs of stone, wide and regular, led down from where he stood. He could distinctly make out where the passage was in, continued on the far side, for its narrowing opening was well illuminated by another wall lamp. It served as an entrance or exit to the floor level of the temple, and lay perhaps fifty or sixty feet below and directly opposite where he stood. Just below his present level, some ten feet down, a wide ledge of stone ringed the center hall, and from it, at regular intervals, columned archways indicated the existence of further tunnels. Though he was tempted to explore these, some dread curiosity prompted him to hold his course and follow where the light beckoned below. Down into the murk he went, past the leaning sculptures of fearsome beasts that snarled at him in muted savagery. His hurrying footsteps whispered back at him from the surrounding stone tears. Quickly he moved under the lamplight, through an antechamber where dozens of priestly robes hung suspended from hooks on the walls, down a flight of uneven steps, before he was confronted by a heavy door. He hesitated momentarily, then pressed his ear to the wood. Not a sound. The large keyhole revealed a dark, spacious room beyond, with a faint glow playing over trestle tables and stools. There was little choice now. He had to open it or turn back. The cold doorknob revolved for an eternity before he could feel the spindle pulling back the bolt. It was not locked. He pushed it open swiftly to counteract the possible creaking of hinges, slipped through, and shut it with the same motion. The dying remains of a fire gleamed redly from a corner hearth. Jugs and cups littered the tabletops. There was a stale smell of sour wine and old leather. A curtained doorway stood ten paces from the glowing embers, a faint rumble emanating from it. He stole over to it, but recognized the rhythmic rise and fall of a snoring man before he even touched the heavy fabric. The place had the air of a guardroom, and the snoring beyond the curtain was caused, in all probability, by several sleeping soldiers. It was a dead end then, unless... A quick examination of the rest of the room yielded another exit. An iron gate similar to the ones he had scaled earlier stood ajar in a rather crude opening. He pressed through the gap without touching it. Light streamed up at him through an opening in the floor. Twenty feet below, through a grilled trapdoor, he glimpsed the well-lit chamber. Though heavy to lift, the door was well used and made no sound. A ladder stretched downwards. The prickling at the back of his neck warned him that he had to be close to some sordid secret of the place. The size of this chamber compared to the temple he had seen earlier. Massive iron gates kept the way to his left, heavy chains had locked securely in place. He was suddenly aware of a close and rank reptilian odor, and a low rumbling snort as of a gigantic bull about to charge. Instinctively, he felt for the blade inside his coat, his eyes on the thick chain of the gate. Here was imprisoned or housed a monster of lethal potency. Hurrying past the horror cage, he looked about for an exit of interest, all too aware that his time was running out. A bright lamp hung above an arched doorway in the wall opposite. He approached with some trepidation. It was a strong door that was apparent at first glance. The wood was stained and dark from the touch of damp and countless hands. Iron hinges flared elaborately over the heavy wood, and the nails were overly thick like the ones used on a ship. Rune's imagination was playing tricks. Something was whispering in the dark beyond this door, a menace beyond visualizing, and with it came the fluttering of wings, frantically, as of a trapped bird. He felt a touch of the horror of a small boy for the dark, unreasonable yet overpowering. 
A strange compulsion made him reach for it, first removing his glove, as if a touch of its solid strength could dispel the strongest of his doubts and wipe away the mist of uncertainty forever. He noticed in stark detail the hideous gargoyle face around the keyhole, the twisted greenish copper rope of the latch, the bleeding gash where wood had splintered away. Then the touch, amazingly cold, and the slow sigh of despair that lingered in his throat till he had to gasp for breath. He had no memory after of opening the door, nor of stepping through it. Perhaps he never did. Perhaps he saw the place only in his mind, for it seemed little more than a dream afterwards, when he walked again in daylight. The lamps burned silvery white, casting pale light over the interior and secreting an almost sweet odor. The oil feeding the wicks pooled the dull blue in their bowls of glass. The ambiance was soft and inviting, like a lady's bower, though he had no doubt what sort of place it was. A few of the structures were familiar to him, since he had seen similar tools in the aisles. But they were silent now, motionless, at rest. The long strands of hanging chain, wooden spars like open arms, ropes stretched tight over wheels and pulleys, a ghostly graveyard of pain. Rows of coiled whips and curved blades hung in silent threat upon the walls. Here men spilled all their secrets and pleaded in vain for a merciful end. The perfumed oil was beginning to confuse his senses. The time and urgency faded into the distance, and he was uncertain how he had come to be in this place. How long he stood mesmerized he was not sure. It could not have been for more than a few moments, for the first sound he heard, though but a slight one, startled him back to complete awareness. A low moaning floated from the cells below the hall of torture. It was of a disconcerting nature, suggesting at once that no human being could make such a sound. Surely, whatever had been dragged in here and subjected to the touch of such calculated suffering could no longer be human. A voice spoke behind him, sharp and commanding. I learn. He swung about, every muscle tense as a bowstring. He was outside the door, one hand still gloveless, facing an armed stranger. His quick blow caught the man where he had intended, the unprotected throat. He was away before the guard had clasped his hands to the bruised windpipe and uttered his first gasp for breath. A quick glance at the top of the ladder told him that the man had not recovered, but instead fallen to his knees in agony. The sudden darkness of the guardroom made him momentarily clumsy, and he upset a chair in his haste. It had hardly clattered to the floor before he was leaping up the stairs to the temple. As he passed the statues in a mad rush, the dull sound of a gong reached his ears. Could it simply be the end of the third watch, or was it an alarm? He would not linger to find out. Up the wide steps of the amphitheater he flew, his mind recalling every step of the way ahead. Into the lit passage, paying no heed to the echo of his footfalls, Rune heard again the dull resounding of the gong. Now there was no doubt. He left the lamps in their sockets and wasted no time dashing them to pieces, since childhood memory told him that the tour could see in the dark even better than he. All he needed now was enough speed to stay in front of the swelling tide. A shout stabbed at him when he passed the first intersection. If only he could reach the connecting tunnel and enter it without being spotted. An answering shout rang out from up ahead. He was cut off. The second intersection brought him up short. He dashed into the passage leading off to his left. As soon as it turned, he halted to look for a hiding place. Vital moments passed as his eyes adjusted to the heavy shadows. He could hear the parties meeting in surprise and consternation. An arched support loomed but three paces away from him. He leaped up, his fingers barely latching onto a rough protrusion of rock. His feet found a groove deep enough to allow him a change of handholds. Shouted instructions warned him that the guards had split up at the intersection and would come storming past at any moment. The booted rush was about to round the corner when he pulled himself with a stifled groan into the ceiling behind the deeper dark of the arch. He trembled with the effort of holding on, at once grateful that at least one hand was not inhibited by a glove. His pursuers did not pause in their charge, nor did they suspect that their quarry could be so plastered to the wall as to put him beyond their keen sight. 
They lumbered past, a good dozen of them. He was about to drop to the passage floor below when two more figures rounded the bend. They walked along in a casual fashion, obviously of a higher rank than the rushing guards, and correspondingly less fleet of foot. Content to guide their men in the right direction, they needed not exert themselves overly in the actual chasing of the intruder. After all, there seemed to be only one. Where would he run to, with every exit guarded? They halted almost directly beneath his hiding place, with one actually leaning with an outstretched hand against the support. In indifferent tones, they complained to each other about this trivial matter that had interrupted their rest. Rune was amazed at the ill turn of luck. Gritting his teeth, he measured the chances of falling on them and putting them to silence before they could recall the guards. Yet desperation kept him in place. For all he knew, the guards had already turned at some dead end and were on their way back. Why else would these fellows linger here? Uncomfortable or no, he dared not bat as much as an eyelid. He could not get caught in this place. Rather, let an assassin's blade find him somewhere in the aisles, than be torn apart over time and consumed by these horrors. And for what? So he could ramble about locked doors and mysterious tunnels when he saw Garth again. The old man already knew these existed. What more could he tell him? How was he supposed to find something when he did not know what to look for? He had been a fool to venture here. Still, the men talked. His arms felt like tearing from their sockets. He needed to move just ever so slightly, only to shift his weight. A laugh sounded from below. Then one clapped the other on the shoulder. Slowly, lazily, they ambled off after their guards. Rune forced himself into a slow count to ten before he moved. His strained muscles did not allow him a careful descent or soft landing, and he dashed off as soon as his feet touched ground. He traded some of his swiftness in order to listen for the noise of the guards up ahead. Fortunately, they seemed to care little for stealth in their pursuit, and why should they? He reached the passage without further incident and ducked into its darkness with relief. He was perspiring heavily and half decided to remove the cloth over his mouth, for it inhibited his breathing and was soaked. Yet he hesitated and left it in place, for the threat had not disappeared from the night air and he still had the slaver's compound to traverse and the inn to reach. The gap between the inner gate and the tunnel roof seemed even smaller than he remembered. He was thoroughly winded and out of sorts before he reached the ground on the other side. Moreover, one of the sharp tips of the gate bars had torn a painful gash in the palm of his bare hand. The nursing of this pain almost betrayed him. There was movement in the hall. Several figures hovered round the central brazier in sullen silence. Some were still strapping on girdles and armor. He squatted down like a falling rag, pressing himself to the bars of the slave cage next to him. None of the men seemed too enthusiastic in what they were doing, and he gathered that they were not pleased at being roused at this early hour. Now he was properly trapped, his retreat cut off. He wondered with alarm how long the old man and his companions in the outer cage could keep the handler quiet. Perhaps he had already alerted his superiors, and it was they who had brought the men here to await Rune's return. Something pulled at his sleeve, sending a chill through his entire body. Next to his face appeared another, large-eyed and dirty. A small face, a little girl perhaps seven cycles old, stared at him open-mouthed. He pressed his finger to his lips, and to his relief saw her nod slowly. Immediately she motioned to him, with an outstretched hand to remain where he was. There was something reassuring in her manner, as if the scene before them was a familiar thing to her. She lay down on the sacking that served as her bed, but did not close her eyes. Instead, she kept staring at him, a little smile turning up the corners of her mouth. He found it strangely disconcerting, to be the object of such close scrutiny, especially since he had no way of rewarding the little creature's apparent trust. And yet, he drew out the ring of keys he had taken from the handler. Carefully removing the one for the old man's cage, he slipped the others through the bars. Sure enough, the men departed in a grumbling huddle soon after, 
and he could sneak out the way he had come. The morning was not far off when he reached the outer cage again. He had the slaver thrust out of the cage, and then surrendered the key to the old man with specific instructions not to attempt an escape that night. Unless they knew where to hide in the city, it would be better to conceal the key and wait for a more appropriate opportunity. They would not get far if caught in the daylight in the marshes. In the end, he did not return to the inn that night. Instead, he visited another for an early breakfast and a wash, after which he trudged wearily back into the market to arrange for the sale of his goods. Only when Lauren's eyes peered once more over the room of the world did he make his way to his lodgings, where the many watchful eyes would no doubt narrow in puzzlement. He slept almost to the noon watch, having decided not to return to the tunnels of Nunmeric. Garth could not complain that he had not made the effort, and nearly lost his life in the bargain. That should content the old man. The guards of the subterranean realm would also be on the alert now, increasing the risk tenfold. And what, after all, had he discovered? Had he not merely stumbled round another man's dungeon? What of it if it was a particularly sinister one? Did not the ruling of the swamps and the base folk who lived here require such? Rune decided not to await the arrival of his goods. He had already acquired a contact for future shipments and arranged for the disposal of the present one. He was off a day before the caravan was due and would simply inform Hassar's men, in passing, who to contact once they reached Lakeside. It was a relief to depart from the humid climate and fetid air of the marshlands. He had no more liking for the master of this realm than he had for the land itself. Yet he had seen little to substantiate Karth's claims of a great threat hidden here among the bogs. Malik was little more than a large-scale black marketer. His realm was too poor to support a sizable force, and he was forced to exploit the weaknesses of other nations to turn a profit and maintain his kingdom. There was much here to disgust, even disturb, a hardened man such as himself. The place reeked of evil, not that of grand design, but the small local horrors of the basest self-gratification. What made it so unsavory was that every creature here seemed to be infected with it. Too many men in Lakeside enjoyed hurting. They were stooped in cruelty and the perverse enjoyment of inflicting pain. The lowest levels of savagery were practiced more or less openly. Most shocking of all was the realization that he had become so much like them that the pain of others dulled his own. Yet the suffering of innocence still stirred in him the memory of pity. But who was innocent in all this realm? The image of the little girl in the slaver's cage loomed before him, and the coughing old man with his companions. Yet it was easy to reduce them to the animals they were. If they had aided him, it had only to seek their own advantage. They were unable to help themselves, pathetic, miserable creatures. Malik Yulian crushed the litter in a fist trembling with the violence of his grip. He closed his eyes and leaned back. The audacity of Kale! If the tidings had but reached here sooner, the Viron spy would be wandering the marshlands without eyes or hands. So the exile had joined with the summoner. He smiled ruefully. How desperate had the fool become! And what could he have discovered in his short stay? That Malik could be duped? Let them believe it. There would be another meeting, and they were certainly unaware of his latest intelligence. The pity it was that the fake caravan of merchants had already departed. They would have served well to teach the northern fools something of the treachery of the marshes. Yet it would be better still to play their little game to the full. The exile would not wander onto Malik's web again to boast about it afterwards.